Okay, everybody, welcome to the advanced surfacing. So in the last class, it was more about how to make surfaces. And I was going through the picks and clicks of actually constructing surfaces. I'm going to do a little of that today. But a lot of it's just going to be running through models because advanced models have so many features, like this helmet that we're going to work on has about 150 features. So I'm not going to make you sit and watch me do 150 features. We just don't have time for it. So this is going to be the first model that I'm going to go through is a helmet here. It's got some crazy surfacing in the back. And show you a little bit how I designed it. So you notice that there is a head sitting in there. Um, it is a good idea to get some sort of scale when you're building something, make sure that it will fit. You can find models pretty much anywhere these days as far as 3D models, but you have to be aware of what you're getting. Um, like this model here actually came over as an OBJ, which is a type of 3D model it usually comes from nerve modelers. Um, we can import rhinos, we can import 3D scans, things like that. If you have the SOLIDWORKS Premium, you have scan to 3D, and it'll bring in um, these types of files like OBJ, XYZ, things that you can get from scans or from 3D modelers. But you do want to be aware when you do get something like this. I think this is coming from a scan, and it's not a very good scan. So Wow. You can see all the little gaps and holes inside of these surfaces. Remember, we mm -hmm. talked about those little blue lines, and mm -hmm. you spot those, it means there's an opening. There's tons of openings here. There's no way you're going to get this into a model. You can sit there for hours and hours trying to paste all these. So beware of what you get. If you're getting stuff that's coming from, like, 3D Studio Max or Rhino, the people that were modeling it didn't care if it was an enclosed volume. They just wanted to make sure that it looked like whatever you were trying to make it look like. So I didn't use that one for my scale. I actually went to GrabCAD, found myself a head. There it is now. So I'm going to build a helmet around this. I've actually got some of it already started. So all I did here was I created a sketch. It's got a spline that's mirrored, extruded it with some draft outward, get myself the very bottom of the helmet. And I'm overbuilding here because the helmet's actually going to have like a swoopy bottom at the at it. But it's just like a haircut. It's always good to have more than less because you can't grow anymore. So when you're making surfaces, always overbuild. So that's what I'm doing here. I'm only going to build part of the helmet and then I'm going to work on the crown separately. Remember I talked about the convergence point last time. If you have something that's got a point where it converges, you're going to have trouble offsetting this. And the helmet's going to have an inner helmet, an outer helmet, and then an even further inside where the foam is. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to need to offset this surface several times. So I want to try and not have three-sided surfaces when I build this. Because if you try to loft this all the way to one single point, it will do it, but you'll have problems downstream when you try to get bigger or smaller with it. All right, with that said, I'm going to start lofting here. Um, because this is a multiple contour sketch, it automatically sends me into the selection manager. And there we go. OK, put that back. So that's the beginning of it. I'm also going to have it hold. That's why I built the bottom of this thing was so that I had an area to guide it along that shape of the helmet. Mm -hmm. I am going to, on the start and end, I'm doing a loft so I can control the start and the end. I'm going to have it come normal to profile so that I don't get like a peak or anything right down or a ridge down the middle. I talked about this last time where this is not a parametric number, it's more of a ratio. So I'm just keeping it normal to profile, we're coming 90 degrees off that mid plane for a tiny bit so that it um, blends smoothly without any ridges at the front or the back. I don't really have to worry about controlling the guide curve here. If you saw that preview, there's going to be 
like a little lip that goes around the bottom of the helmet. So you do want to be aware of as you're building this stuff, don't always worry about constant curvature. Think about what's going on top of this. If there's layers and things running into that area, don't even worry about trying to keep tangency or anything like that because it can screw your surface up. Speaking of screwing the surface up, you'll take a look at the top of this thing. It's starting to get a little squirrely here at the top as it gets closer to that convergence. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that because I overbuilt this. I knew that that was going to happen, so I built those curves way taller than I actually really wanted them. This line right here is pretty much where the crown of the helmet's going to be. So I'm going to snip away that part where it starts to um, fluctuate. And I'll just use the trim surface for that. And with this edge, I'm going to remove that top. Okay. Uh -huh. So at this point, not really much of a helmet yet. Let's continue building on it. So I'll take that lofted surface and I'll mirror the body. Remember those blue edges mean that they're open surfaces. So right now, none of this is really connecting to itself. Mm -hmm. You guys remember how to make surfaces connect to each other? Knit. Knit, yes. All right, so you guys were paying attention last time. Excellent. Last time when I was building this stuff, uh, it was pretty watertight, so I didn't have any of these gaps. But you can take a look. Here's an example of that where the surfaces don't really meet up exactly. So it's telling me, hey, there's some gaps in between these surfaces. Before I can knit those, I need to fix them. If you really wanted to, you could uncheck this if you want to have holes in your model, but it's a pretty good idea just to leave those checked. Hit your green check mark, and now I just have the two open blue contours at the top and bottom. Okay, find where I'm at. Perfect. Next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create a split line here. And I'm just doing this for some construction geometry that I want to build. And I've showed you the split line before where you can take a sketch and you can split something up. Um, there's a bunch of different ways to create split lines. You can do a silhouette, and that's more if you're trying to find where the split line on part is. You can say, okay, if I'm looking from the top, where is the silhouette of this, where it goes. Um, you know, the very peak of the edge, or you can also do intersection, which I'm doing here. Where I'm going to say, I want to find out where that plane crosses these two surfaces. Mm -hmm. All right. Stuff starting to get in my way, so I'm going to hide the construction geometry that I don't need anymore. And you saw in that preview of that helmet that I showed you, it had sort of a, a oh, you know what? I have forgotten a step here. So before I start cutting this thing up, <clears throat> let me fill this in. So, sorry getting ahead of myself. I'm going to fix this up because this is actually the inner helmet here. Mm -hmm. So remember I showed you the filled surface? And the filled surface will cap the end off of this thing, but I don't have much control over it if I just use the filled surface. So before I do, let me create a sketch here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create just a simple two points line. Remember, the spline starts off as a straight line, but I can play around with the tangency, either the direction or the magnitude of it. And I'm going to set this thing to have equal curvature to the other pieces of the helmet. If you're still not happy with that, you can actually play around with the magnitude here at the curvature as well. So get it to be about what I'm after. You can put dimensions on these as I showed you last time if you really want to control exactly how much um, magnitude that curvature vector has. But now when I do this filled surface, remember it 
fills automatically like that. I can set it to be curvature, but that's pretty short. It's going right through the guy's head. That's where this constraint curve comes in. I can actually guide how the fill blends into it. So not only is it coming curvature on the edges, but it's also trying to adhere to that um, construction geometry that I put in there. Okay. There we go. So that was what I was after. Um, let me go back into that fill because it doesn't look right. There we go. Um, when you hit curvature or tangency or whatever in that pull down, it's just going to apply it to whichever last edge you pick, unless you tell it, I want to apply this at every edge. So I noticed that it, it didn't look curvature to me. I've just been working with surfaces long enough to go, no, didn't do that one right. So set it so it's curvature all around. And it's also got that guide curve. It's got curvature continuity. So I've got a nice smooth surface. Knit these guys together again so that I can offset them. So there's the exterior of the helmet. And do the same thing towards the inside. And I can use those later when it comes time to make the exterior shell and the foam that I'm making for the inside of the helmet. I will cap off the bottom um, soon enough here. In fact, um, I can do that right now if I want. If I want to make this as a solid, um, I certainly can, but I'll do that later on. Okay. So I've got one already done here where I, I sort of changed the the way that they're displayed so that you can see what's going on. I've got the inner one that's going to be where the foam comes in contact with the guy's head. The middle shell is actually the inside of the helmet. The outer shell is outside of the helmet. <clears throat> so let's take a look at this outside of the helmet. This is the point where I wanted to do that. Um, offset surface and trim it. Okay, I'll do that split line, say where that plane intersects this helmet, I want to split right there. Now, I'm going to delete this face out of here. Because on the outside helmet, I want to have that little swishy thing on the back there. Aerodynamics. For the aerodynamics, just to make it look cool. We can make it look more modern. Didn't want uh, Monty heckling me. So <laughs> took a look at some of the recent helmets, and they got swooshy stuff on the back of them these days. So I'm going to build a couple of splines here. It's always a good idea if you want to have a pronounced peak between your splines to do two splines. If you try and do it as a single spline, it's always going to be a smooth curve and you're never going to get that peak there. So <laughs> um, just keep that in mind when you're modeling your sketches. So I want this to come off curvature from this, this to come off with curvature from that. Take a look at it again and figure out exactly how swooshy we want it to be. And this is why I put in this split line right here is because I'm going to do a 3D sketch at this point. And do a spline from this point to that point. Again, a spline starts as, as a beeline, but you can control it. You can even select those handles and add relations. Notice when I move around here, you can see the axes of the part. When you're in a 3D spline, you no longer have horizontal and vertical because cool, it doesn't really apply in 3D space. But I can say I want this to go along the x-axis. And so it comes straight off the back there. <clears throat> I can also have this come off tangent 
from that split line edge. So not only did it give me a vertex to snap to, but I can also control it. It comes straight off of that. Cool. So that's half of what I want the back to look like. Let's go into a boundary surface here. So I want to use that 3D sketch, matte edge for part of it, and then that's going to be my control. Uh, it went all nutty, but I showed you guys last time that you can actually control how much that it does. Do you remember how to do that? Guessing no from the silence. <laughs> it's this trim by direction right here. If you check that on, it will only use that second guide curve until it hits one of the cross sections and then it'll stop. Otherwise, it was trying to use that entire sketch that I drew. <laughs> okay, so there's the back. You notice that I didn't put too much controls on it. I do want one control. Um, as far as for this second one, and here's where the, the really the power of the boundary surface comes in is the fact that I can control the tangency, not only at the cross sections, but at the guide curves as well. And then I'll just mirror that surface body across this midpoint. There you go. That's the back of my helmet. Any questions so far? No, I was going to say that's a nice a lot of times. I'll just I'll make a I'll just extrude um, a straight surface and then make my other surface tangent to that or curvature to that as opposed to using the direction vector built into the tool. Right, and this just keeps it because we do have so many features there. Mm -hmm. uh, I try to keep it down to a low war. If I can mm -hmm. use that's clear. construction geometry, I'll do it. It's tougher. It's cleaner for me, but for somebody who's model who's coming in to work on this model, it might be confusing as to what I'm doing. Where if you did it your way, Jason with the reference geometry, they see that and they're like, oh, it's, it's well, then I, come back. <clears throat> I usually go back and delete all those extra bodies. But yeah. I just confuse them later. Yeah. Well, I cleaned up the model afterwards so they can, but I guess if you're working through it, line by line, it's clean. All right. So I'm going to knit this up again, just so I have one um, <coughs> single line here. Interesting, it didn't delete the split line. No, it's uh, if I wanted to, sometimes I will offset, you know, do a copy of zero if I'm going to split something up because just the act of splitting something can actually make very small changes to your zebra stripes. Okay. Um, but here I'm just trying to, to run through it as quick as I can. Yeah. I'm going to create yet another curve here. I probably could just use my 3D curve that I've already got for this but I want wanted you guys to see um, a little clearer what I'm doing on this. So earlier I did a filled surface and I used an edge like this to control it. I'm going to do the same thing here, but last time that I did the filled surface, I made sure that I set this apply to all edges. And that's going to give me something like that, which is not as cool looking as I'd like it to be. So <laughs> what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use a constraint curve. Again, still got some problems here. Yep. But when I highlight this, you can see it highlights which edge I'm looking at. With this applied all edges cleared, I can set curvature to just a particular edge at a time. And then it starts to smooth out. So there we go. I may have wanted to do a little bit more of a swoop on that thing. Uh, sometimes you're going to run into trouble because it's going to be fighting with the curvature and the spline that you've drawn. You know, if you keep it simple, it's going to give you a nice uh, design where if you put too many constraints on what's guiding it, it's kind of like a bunch of people pushing on a tablecloth from different directions where it starts to rip, ripple and kink in the middle because you're trying to keep curvature at so many points that it screws your surface up. So I just gave myself, hey, let's create a nice smooth surface there and I'll worry about this later. 
How am I going to worry about that? I'm going to do something called a free form. You do want to be careful with the free form um, because it basically gives you the ability to sort of do nerve modeling. It throws a UV, which is as opposed to an XY grid, a UV grid is a 3D grid that it throws over this thing. One direction is the U's, the other direction is the V's. And what this allows me to do is I can put in a curve here, add control points if I want. And what this does is it basically lays down a spline there. These controls, these little tangency controls, look very much like spline controls because they act very much like spline controls. I put this point here to keep it, you know, if I start pushing this down, it's going to want to ripple throughout. But if you put a point there, it tries to hold to that point. So you can get a little bit more, but you want to be careful. If you just start dragging this thing off into space, it's just like dragging a 3D spline into space. You really have no idea which direction that thing is going to go in according to uh, how you're looking at it. So if you do want to move something, they did give you these nice little handles here where you can move it linearly up a certain amount. Or if you grab this webbing in between them, you can just slide it on that plane without it going back and forth on you. Because that's really the problem is you think you're pulling it up and you're actually pushing it back. So use those control points if you're gonna start playing around with this stuff. But now that can give us a, you know, much more swoopy looking feature there. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna try and fill up this. Doesn't want to let me do it. Laminated edges cannot be filled. Nope. That means that there's two separate surfaces here. I'm going to need to knit them together. Um, Monty had mentioned that we're going to make this into a solid at some point, so I might as well just do it now. I'll control select both these bottom edges, put a planar surface in between them. I'm going to fill better. And then I can grab all of these, knit them, and say, yes, try to form a solid. Again, there's that wishy-washy try. Crossed. Always go and check and see if it actually did it right after you finish. So it did give me a solid. Now I'm going to use a fillet. It should work a whole lot better. I'm going to use a different type of fillet than usual, something called a variable radius fillet. What the variable radius fillet allows me to do is along the fillet itself, I can change it to be, you know, a half inch here, an inch there, and it'll undulate and extrapolate how those are supposed to go between the control points that I gave it. You can actually go between more than one curve. You'll see that when I do it, I can, every one of these little pink dots, I can control the radius at that. If I need more little pink dots, I can bump this number um, up right here. But it doesn't matter to me because I'm only concerned with three points here. I'm concerned with the ends, which you can actually assign to zero if you want. And I do want. So I apply those to zero, and then I give this one a size. And the no preview is never a good sign. So let's see. It's just Fill it's too big. Mm -hmm. Let me try this again. Oh. No. It's is it because you're tangent propagating it to the front and you don't want to do that? Oh, I'm tangent right. propagation maybe screwing things up. Yeah, it looks like it's you only got the balls on the four on the right side. I don't see the balls on the left side. So. Yeah, it only has the balls on the one on the last one that you selected. Okay. So if I needed to set those, I'd, I'd do the left, set them all, then click on the right and set them all. But um, it's just trying to get me to break out in the hives here. So. Let me <laughs> surfacing and SolidWorks does that. So I 
grab one off the shelf here. And did I make a solid? Yeah. Okay. Hooray. Okay. Cheater. <laughs> ain't cheating, ain't trying. All right. So there we go. Um, got a, a radi multiple radius fillet. Uh, again, this is just a recipe for disaster because it is coming to a three pointed, a three sided face. So if I was going to use this later to offset, I would have trouble. But since this is the outer shell um, and it let me get away with it, I'm actually pretty good here. Let me hide this for a second and show the interior one again. Show you something called extend surface. I think I showed this last time, but what extend surface does is it'll try to give you more of the exact same surface. Uh, if you just choose linear here, it's going to shoot a surface off tangent to that surface that you're working from. And there's going to be a pronounced line where that happened. But if you leave it set to same surface, it's going to be curvature continuous. And it's also not even going to show you where that edge originally was. It's truly the same surface just extrapolated further out whatever distance you asked it to. And then I can use this surface to cut with. So cut with surface towards the inside of the outside. You want to pay attention to this little arrow. So it's going to cut everything to the inside. And there we go. I've got the inside of my helmet and the outside of my helmet all playing together so far. So if you haven't noticed, I'm doing more of like face by face design here with this surface modeling. And that's what surface modeling is really all about. You don't always have to use surfaces to create faces. There are some tools that I'm going to show you um, to get some really nice faces that you need to have a solid to do it with. So let me make this thing transparent and show the head again because what i'm after here is i want to make this thing's going to have the earphones built into it so there's going to be these little bulges that come out at the ear so they can fit the earphones in there without you having to try and squish your head in there so i'm going to trace this guy's ear um, i can do it with either a style spline or a regular spine i'm just going to use a regular spline and ballpark it in there. You see that you can play around with, you know, exactly how this goes. Again, as with any spline, uh, when you start playing around with it, you'll see that even the top of the ear starts to get messed up as I screw around with it too much. So you want to be careful with how exactly you tug and pull on that thing. <clears throat> and for this, I'm going to extrude. a giant bar through the thing without merging the results. Here's a trick as well. If you select a body and you choose to isolate, it'll just show you that body. It hides everything. Also, whenever bodies are hidden and you're doing cuts or things like that, it only affects the shown bodies. So when you are working on a multi-body part and just want to work on a particular section, it's a good idea to use that isolate so that you don't accidentally cut holes and the other features as well. Here's one of those tools that you need to, to use a solid for. It's called a dome. Uh, it was originally for making um, like cylinder heads. So you'll see that it'll dome out a certain distance. If you turn off this continuous dome, it gives you a nice elliptical dome off the top of that. And you can set how far you want that come off of there. You'll see it gives you a nice smooth cap on the end of it. Hit enter, gets you into the same tool again. There we go. So that's kind of weird looking. 
But what I'm doing here is I'm going to use that tool to actually knock out where the hollows are going to be for the earphones. And the tool that I'm going to use for that is something called indent. Has anybody ever used this before? Yeah, I haven't used it in this kind of application. I've done it with sheet metal. Yeah, it is good for sheet metal. It's also good, yeah, for, for pressing a part in there, sort of like giving you a drawn part type of thing where you pick what you want to push out into and then sorry about it does matter which side you select to um, also if you choose cut it'll just push it'll just cut that shape into your solid otherwise if you don't turn cut it actually pushes it out and you can set the thickness you can also put in a gap there if you want it just like you know millimeter or whatever to give yourself clearance on either side you can set up a um, tolerance right here for what that gap is but now i can hide these two show this thing non-transparent there we go. Here we go. Little ear indents. Okay, but I want those not to just stick straight out. I want them to have a fillet around them. There's a couple of different ways you can fillet this. If I do a face fillet, it gives me a lot more choices than if I just do an edge fillet as to how it blends the fillet into the faces around it. So if I say I want this face to have a fillet between these two faces. By default, it wants to put in just your regular old fillet, where you're going to see a line where the tangency happens. But when you're using a face fillet, you actually have some more choices. I can do curvature continuity around it. And you'll see that it cleaned up that bottom for me a whole lot better. Also, when I do like zebra stripes on it, I'm not going to have as defined of a problem. Now, when you do this, it will, it won't tell you whether it succeeded or not. Um, some other CAD programs that I've seen with curvature continuity, same thing. You say, hey, I want a perfectly curvature continuity, continuous. It does it, but it doesn't tell you, oh, I, I couldn't do it all the way around. Um, there are some ways to check, you know, those zebra stripes are helpful. So it looks like um, you didn't really get it in every spot. Here's how you find out for sure. If you pick an edge, you can say deviation analysis, and it'll show you how much it deviated. It actually did it pretty good on that edge right there. This edge has some more problems down here where it's running into that other face, and you can see where it's not perfectly coming into the same curve. It's a half of a, or, oh, sorry, <laughs> much less than half, 0 0.05 of a degree off of being the same curve. So um, somebody's gonna have to put some sandpaper to it at that point. The other thing that you can do with those types of fillets is you can also do um, conic fillets. I believe in the uh, 2016, you can also do conic fillets when it comes to uh, just a regular edge. But in, in 2015, you have to do a face fillet to get these types of fillets. Um, but you'll see that as I start playing with these numbers here, what it does is it's kind of like you're crossing a chamfer with a fillet. How close do you want it to be rounded or to be sharp? When you're at 0.95, you see that it pretty much looks like a chamfer at this point. The smaller this number gets, the closer it gets to being rounded. So these will give you those kind of sort of crease 
fillets where you can actually see, you actually want to see uh, along the middle of the fillet, a little bit of a line there. So instead of it being just a radius there. It's what if you change the row to like point, point one? Just, sorry, and then last one. Sure. Just point one? Yeah, just, just clarify the opposite. So it's not, is it more like a straight line? Yeah. Okay. But that's more clear in my head now. Okay. Okay, one last thing I'm going to do on this helmet. I'm not going to build the whole thing, but I do want to show you another tool called a ruled surface, which we haven't used before. So I want to have a little piece of this thing along the bottom that's sort of like a, a lip that goes all the way around this. Unfortunately, I've got these ear bulges in there. One nice thing about surfaces I showed you earlier is that, you know, they maintain their independence from the rest of the model. So if I roll back in my feature manager tree and I choose to offset this thing a little bit, when I roll forward, it's not going to get, you know, merged into the rest of it. It's still independent. So for this, do a little swoopy design here. All right. Surface, trim surface, remove the top. And this is where that lip comes into contact with the rest of the, right, or this is where the lip is going to be with the rest of the helmet. Now, what a ruled surface allows me to do is it allows me to shoot a surface straight off an edge. It will let me pick one. There we go. So you see what it's doing here? I can control how far out it goes and which direction it goes. Right now, this one is trying to stay perpendicular to the surface around it. You can also control taper if you want. If I want to say, okay, I want this thing 60 degrees measured from the top plane. See, I get that angle in reference to that. You know, this is a tool I've used quite a bit for doing molds. Yeah, that's what it's originally designed for. That ruled surface is really for finding the split line and then shooting the split line out. Yeah. And so you can cut the mold in half. But you can also use it in here for like constructing geometry. And mm -hmm. um, works really nice. Any questions on any of those? I know I covered a lot of features really quickly right there. No? All right. Let's try something else. So here's a joystick that's much more complex than like that throttle handle that I did last time, um, where I've got a lot of cool surfaces here that'll fit right into your thumb. So let's take a look at some of these. I'll, I'll go through here. So I built a, one surface that just shows me, hey, this is what the thing mounts up to. So I left that as a surface so it doesn't get in, uh, you know, sucked into the rest of the design. And then the same thing as the helmet. I started off with this and just extruded it out with an angle. But here's another way that you can use freeform. So I used freeform on the top of the helmet to kind of say, okay, I want this thing pushed out here a little bit. Um, you can get really crazy with your freeform if you want. You can just take a sheet of surface like this, hit freeform. Let's say I want to have it at symmetry. It's nice, you'll notice that all of these say contact. Since this is, thing is symmetrical, if I change one on the left, the right's always going to adhere to it. So I can start playing around with where I want this surface to be in space. If they're set to contact, they're not going to move. Um, the tangent and curvature, that has to do if your 
surface has other surfaces on either side of it. It's going to take a look. This thing is sort of in space, so those don't really apply. But you'll see that when I set it to movable, I can either grab these things, and they act like spline controls, just like I was doing on the helmet. You, but you can also, if you hold your control key down and start picking all of these, I can move the entire edge up or down. I want this to be more around there. I don't want this thing to have a flat top, so I can play around with this thing, give it more of a swoopy design that I want. Now, currently, you can see that I've got stuff under the original face, over the original face. There's a tool called Replace Face, where I can say, I wish that this flat, boring surface was that cool, swoopy surface. And now it is. If I hide that surface, that's what the top of that model has for it. So it actually knew enough to cut stuff off the back. And all along the front, it did that extend surface to meet up with where that replace face was. <clears throat> I didn't really want to do that because I've actually already done it. The next thing I want to do is talk to you a little bit about this loft. Now you've done lofts before in your life, I'm sure. Um, and this one's not much different than other lofts you may have done of half life. The thing that's different about how I created this loft was you don't always have to draw every single loft section that you want. Sometimes when you are really trying to micromanage your loft by just putting in tons of cross sections, mm -hmm. it turns into something pretty ugly where you're like, wow, that's not really what I wanted. Yeah. Um, so this is a way to Kind of get your way. Also, it's really nice because I don't have to create a bunch of construction geometry like planes and things like that. So let me show you what I'm what I'm getting at here. Let me try that again. Selection manager, just that edge. Selection manager, just that edge. There we go. Got some guide curves here. And yeah, that's all right, but I wish that it, it tapered in a little here. What you can do is first create the loft, get it over with. If you right click on this, there's a choice to add a loft section. And I can cr move this plane around. If I grab it by the corner, I can even play around with the angle that it's at. And what it's going to do is it's going to lay a sketch right in there that I can control further. That sketch geometry, if I need it to say, go in a little bit. So if we take a look at the actual loft that I did, kill this sketch that I created automatically. Here's what I did. I created that using a loft section and just pulled it in a little bit so the things smoothly tapered in faster than it was doing it before. Um, this will give you better results than if you, you know, I would have had to create a plane at that angle. I would have had to draw a sketch and it probably would have not looked as nice. So it's, it's a cool tool to be like, okay, well, this is pretty much what I want. And then as you look at it, you're like, no, I wish it was a little thinner here. I wish it was a little thinner there. You can just start throwing in loft sections and control it. Again, keep it to a low roar. If I keep doing this, I'm going to screw it up. But it's good for, you know, one or two pieces. You've seen this? Yet? I haven't used that. Yeah, I've never seen it. That was alert, but made the class worthwhile. <laughs> All right. I, I can always get you one thing, huh, Jason? Yeah. All right. I created this boundary surface just like I did with that um, throttle handle in the last class. In fact, I even copied and pasted the same finger grip from that sketch exactly to give myself a little bit of the bottom. But notice that I'm, you know, mirroring this thing up and also starting to cut areas out because I want to create this thumb rest. 
So I chopped out some pieces here where this is where the thumb rest is going to reside. So I just did a delete face, split the surface up, deleted the, the faces out of there. And then I can create a 3D geometry as to where the edge of that thumb rest is. And this gets a little into how to control a 3D spline. It's really easy when you just have two points. Once you throw the third point in there, it starts to get a little squirrely on you, especially as to where exactly this point resides. Same thing with when I was doing that um, freeform and I just grabbed and pulled something. I don't know if I just pushed that into the model or pulled it out from the model. Yeah, looks like I pulled it out from the model. How do you work on that without having to continually go, gee, what just happened and revolve around? Here's how you do it. Go into the windows and turn on four viewports. When you are looking directly straight down at a point like this one, when you move it here, it's only moving left and right. It's not moving, um, I can move it up and down, but it's not moving backwards or forwards. It's only moving along this YZ plane, if I work on it in that viewport. If I work on it in this viewport, it's only moving along the XY. So I can start to get this thing, you know, dialed in a little better as to where exactly it's going. Also, I can make it come straight off of this thing if I need to and start getting a much better picture of where life, where this thing is in real life. Also, it gives me an isometric here that I can rotate around to see, I don't know, maybe I want it a little bit further in. You have to watch out for it snapping. Um, if you hold down your control key, it will not snap. So um, just to let you know, if you're like, dang it, stop snapping to that. Just hold the control key as you're dragging, and then it will not snap to geometry around it. But that's the best way to control a, a 3D sketch. Once, you, once you've gotten a spline in there, it's hard enough to control a spline anyways, but if you're not really sure what direction it's going when you're tugging on those things, go into this mode. Uh, it'll save you hours of exasperation. And then when you're done, you just go back to single view. I never use the four view. What I always always do is just find the a face view and then just use the shift left, run at 90, move it, shift right, run at 90. Well, also what, I, what I'll do sometimes is just this one. If you click on any of these arrows in the triad, it takes you looking straight down it. Mm -hmm. So then you're only moving in that direction. So sort of what, what you were saying and what he's saying about the, the shift 90 is if you use an arrow key with the shift, mm -hmm. it just rotates it 90 degrees, whatever angle you're doing it. Different ways of getting the same thing, but that's really what you want to do. You want to be looking straight down at this thing so you can get it exactly in 3D space where you want. So in the last lesson, remember I showed you you can create a little ribbon construction geometry? So that's what that is. I just created a little ribbon there that's like, okay, this is where kind of the, I want it rounded off at the end, but this is like, if it was flat, this is where the thumb rest front would be. Then I shot one of those, those ruled surfaces off of it. Why? So I created a boundary solid that came right off of that. Now if I hide that construction geometry, I'm starting to build up you know, where this thumb rest is. And it's just a matter of filling things. Now, some of these are pretty ugly as where when you look at how it blends into the geometry around it. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about that so much right now. Just try and get your part built. I used a full round fillet up at the top. There's one of those variable fillets here. But afterwards, what you wanna do is you wanna go into areas where you know you've got problems. And start working on those problems directly. It's basically like a slash and burn type of thing where I made some geometry around there and cut out 
the problematic area and then filled it back in. So, you know, it's a good idea to just just get it done, kind of like the helmet. Let's let's get this thing made, and then later on I can go in with the free form or the blend later on and start worrying about the tangency and the curvature. If you're trying to get the tangency and the curvature on the on the original pass, you're probably not going to get it, and it's going to take you a long time to not get anything. Where if you build it and are like, yeah, it's good enough for government work, and then later on come in, start cutting out the pieces you don't like and redoing them, you're going to have a lot better results. Um, as far as creating this. So any questions on how I was able to build this thumb rest up? All right, well, I'm glad to hear you guys are learning stuff. Oh, hey, one more thing before I, I go. So this thing wasn't tall enough. I showed you the extend surface when you're working with surfaces. You can say, hey, take this surface and just shoot it mm -hmm. straight off. You can do that at the solid level as well. If this thing is not tall enough to my liking, I can right I click on a face, choose to move face, and you'll see what it's doing here is it's taking the, the surfaces, the, the adjacent surfaces, and extending them and keeping it capped off as a solid. So you don't always have to go with, hey, I better make this thing a surface because I wish it was 10 millimeters taller or whatever. Mm -hmm. You can use this um, offset surface type of thing to do the same thing, where it shoots it just a little bit taller. Please don't use that on regular 3D models instead of just extruding your base farther. Oh, works good. No, no, don't do that. <laughs> Ever do that. Ed says don't do it, but hey, it's, it's another tool in your tool chest. This is a really good example. Obviously, of to use it. it's great. Yeah, yeah. It gets to well, when you're doing that extend surface, even the extend surface has problems with it. Why didn't you just build the surface bigger? Remember how I told you make more surface than you right. need because it's free and you can slice it later. You can put more in there, but if it's coming to a corner and you do the extend, it'll continue that tangency and like loop back on itself. So if it's if it's a nice smooth transition like this, it works pretty cool. But if the thing had been coming trying to come to a point or had a rounded edge, it would have ran into itself and it would have had problems too. Um, even if it let me do it, I would have had problems later when the machinist calls me and like, how come your part's screwing up my cam? Uh, oh, it's because <laughs> I used that extend face and it actually doubled back on itself. Um, yeah, you check your minimum rays of curvature and it's somewhere around, around an angstrom. <laughs> yeah. All right. How about once I do get this now here it is all of that we're going to start talking about another concept as a master model so that first part that i built that you saw me build looked like this got 93 features so it takes a little time to so i built the whole thing right but then this is actually going to be two pieces and there's different ways of doing master models. I'm going to show you three different ways of doing it. This one, I'm just creating another configuration and saying, okay, I'll make a left configuration and a right configuration. And you'll see I've got a folder that says left. All I need to do is just suppress that folder. It goes back to the real one. I make a folder called right, and I do whatever I need to do to make the right configuration. So what did I do to make this left one? Well, I split it in two, did some draft here, and I was stunned that that shell worked. Because <laughs> I was like, oh, give it a shot, what the hell? Um, it's always a good idea to give it a shot. Very rarely does it work. The problem is, you know, especially with something with this many curves, is the curves degrade as you go onto the inside. It doesn't mean that the curves didn't degrade. When I originally did the shell, let me just make sure I got the thickness here. What is that? Two? Two point five? Um, okay. So when you first go to do the shell, feature shell two point five. Say I don't need any of this stuff on the inside. Um, it gives you a warning. Yeah, this probably isn't gonna work. That's okay. Let's give it a shot. 
and you cross your fingers and sometimes it works sometimes it doesn't just because it works does not mean it worked correctly sometimes you roll it backward and then roll it forward and then it crashes you, you, you didn't, do that too even though you didn't change anything it doesn't always work twice yeah <laughs> as you can see so is it gonna go is it gonna go it's gonna go that's a real one come on go there we go so it worked but let's really take a look at what's going on <laughs> okay that's where you're going to get a call from that machinist again hey i put your model in there and it's blowing up there's something see how it's doubling back on itself it's got all these ripples peaks things like that this right here also pretty horrible um so is the graphical interface with that screen but you get the idea that um when you got three-sided surfaces or you got tight corners things like that the shell might work if it doesn't work at all i'm going to show you something where you can actually model the negative space offset where it will work and then start building yourself the where the shell happens but what i did here was i said okay i see where the problems are and i did some split lines to break this problem area out and this one's a little smaller because see, you can see the horrible right at the edge. So I give it a nice smooth curve and split that. And then, as Monty had guessed, I deleted those the hell out of there. This one, I just did a fill surface. And because I put a nice round corner at this end, it got it a whole lot better this time. The problem was, was that it that curve had degraded so far here that that degradation followed through the entire surface. Hmm. Where if you say, okay, no, I want it to start off with a smooth curve right there. Um, I got a little bit better results. With this one, I had to dicker around a little bit more, make sure that this thing had, again, take a look at where the problem's coming. So this straight edge trying to go down into this shape is going to give me a problem. So I just, Rounded it off because I didn't actually want it to terminate like that. And then again, it was able to do the filled surface for me. Knit it together, it formed a solid, shelled it out, and then started working on the fastening features to go on to so that it snaps together and screws in, in like it's supposed to. But okay, so the, the point of this was that just because your shell or your offset worked, you know, it's not time for the happy dance yet. You're a whole lot closer than you were before, but go in and take a look, especially the, the reason I knew where to look is where is the sharpest corner here? There's a sharp corner there. You know, I looked at every one of those finger ripples. I looked at the top here and took a look at those edges. If they're disappearing completely or they're degrading like this one was, chances are you're gonna have some uh, geometry that's pretty ugly. And you wanna clean that up so that somebody can actually make it someday. Okay, how am I doing so far? Any questions on what I was doing with that part? All right, so again, this gets into the master model idea. I built the whole joystick first and was like, okay, this is both halves of the joystick. Then you work on the left side, work on the right side. In this case, I'm actually doing it using configurations, but there's a couple other ways um, to create top down or in context types of models. So here is a little jet drive. It goes on the outrigger arms of our wave hopper we were working on last time there's the impeller sucks the water in it's the propeller shoots it out there there's your jet boat type of motor <clears throat> doesn't take any electricity right just runs on uh make believe <laughs> yeah run, there's going to be a shaft that goes through there to actually spin it later but come on Ed, this is still conceptual design it is pretty <laughs> Uh, I can bring up the model later. There is an electric motor that's hooked up to it. So that's how it actually spins. Thank you for clarifying. Yeah. Just use the force, man. <laughs> if you're really good, you can do it yeah. counterclockwise. <clears throat> okay. Magnetic, magnetic induction. <laughs> Some neat stuff. Let's 
throw this part Bring into an assembly. Magic. So. so one of the ways that we can do top-down design is right inside the same assembly. So I want those two pieces to fit inside here. So I'll create a new part. Um, so assembly, insert, new part, and just drop it on the front plane. Now when you drop in the part, it's a good idea just to use the front plane because whatever plane you pick is going to be the front plane of your part. Just keep it consistent, I'll pick that. It also puts you into a 2D sketch because typically that's how a part is created in SOLIDWORKS. The first thing is a 2D sketch. So it dropped it in on the front plane in a 2D sketch, but I don't actually need to be in a sketch. I'm gonna turn that off. I'm still working on the part. You guys have done top-down design before, hopefully, sometime. Mm. See, this one is blue. That means that's the one I'm working on. I'm actually in the context of the assembly, but I'm working on that part. So anything I create, like in this case, a offset surface is there. Now, notice I've got this button right here. No external references. That's going to make it so that the links are automatically broken. If that's turned on, if I change the size of this thing, that surface will change as well. So it depends on whether, you know, how much flux do you have inside of your design. I've got it so that I don't have to worry about references later. I just say break them automatically. And it tells me I'm going to offset this surface, but it's not going to update if you change the original. So you see that that happened inside of this part. If I open this thing up, a couple of ways to make solids out of your surface bodies. Let's go through them. One way is to draw a line here, draw a line there, and use a parametric dimension or two. Are those allowed in the surface? Oh, yeah. Mid plane. Good enough. Okay, so I showed you this last time around. I love this tool, the intersection tool, because I hate trimming and cutting and all this other crap. You just pick this and say intersect. Now with the other ones, last time I did it, it was just one enclosed volume. So it was like, okay, I'm gonna make this. Here I've got pieces on either side. If you check one of these, it will not create a solid out of that. That will just disappear. Also, this consumes surfaces. I always like to check that on, just so I don't have a bunch of surfaces laying around after I'm done. And, wow, oh, there's the propeller side of things. Okay, get out of that component. How about we do another one for the impeller? Again, I'll just put it on the front plane, say, no, I don't want to worry about that, and offset the surface. Yes, I know it's going to be broken, but it's fine. Okay, this one, going to do something a little strange here. Let's do a planar surface. And now I can do, you know, either knit or intersect because it's really only two surfaces. Knit is fine. I have a solid body here. And then I'm going to use that tool I showed you earlier. Hmm. And I showed you that you could cut with a surface using the cut with surface as the name would imply. You can also use a plane to do a cut with surface and just have that certain plane slice away anything. So that's the basis for my impeller. So that's a way to do the master model. I'm stealing surfaces from that thing. So I know that this thing fits in just like it's supposed to because I'm using the geometry from the original part to do it. Any questions on how I was able to create those two pieces? All right. If I go back into this one, let's take a look at how it was built up. Now, what I did for this part was I created a midplane. So I did a swept surface here. And then later on, just thickened it. 
did a fillet. Now, this is another type of fillet maybe you've never used before. Have you ever used a full round fillet? Mm -hmm. So full round fillet, you pick the side, the top, and the other side, and it'll round it off for you no matter what angle we're coming at each other as long as it's possible. So I rounded those off. What was the move face for? I'm sorry, what's that? What was the move face for? What was the move face for? Oh, I took a little off the bottom. Just being lazy, Dad. <laughs> Just being lazy. I could have cut it. But, you know, I, I know. This, head off. I knew well, this is head off, so I, I used the move face it's, instead. You've been using the NX too much already. I know it. NX is a uh, move face all the time. Um, it works so much better than NX, though. Oh. It's it's basically the same idea, though. So you do it want is. to be careful with the extend, because again, if you got a oh, no, that's coming in, it, it will choke, but fold in on you itself. wouldn't believe some of the stuff you can just move face on the NX. Followers will not do. <laughs> okay, so for this design, I did like a mid plane to create my fin, which is probably the cleanest way to do it. Um, for this one, I probably should have just done the mid-plane design too, but instead, I did it a little differently, where I created these surfaces. And what I'm designing here is I'm actually designing the negative space. So I'm designing the area between the fins. And so this is what you have to do if your shell doesn't work. You're going to have to do sort of that type of stuff. You can offset where you're able to and use fills or do whatever to give yourself, okay, this is the spot that I want to remove from the rest of it. And then I use the combine, which um, not only can you add things, but you can subtract. So I just subtracted all the negative spots from it and it gives me my things. Okay, any questions on that type of master model? So with that type of master model, I'm doing it at the assembly level. I'm saying, okay, the master is actually the cone that the things are sitting in. I'm going to base the basic geometry off of that so I'm ensure it fits into that cone. <clears throat> okay, you guys are looking bored, so I'm going to have to blow your minds here, get you back into it. Got an assembly here. I'm going to go in, I'm going to place a part in here. So you should recognize this from last time around. We created this using the surface bodies and it's a basic layout of the entire model. When you hit the green check mark, it will drop it in at the origin. But here's where the mind flip comes in. Have you ever used that tool right there? The envelope tool. <clears throat> okay. What the envelope tool does, first off, it makes it transparent. Not so exciting. What really is cool about it is this is a phantom. If I go in and say, how heavy is this? There's nothing here. Doesn't get accounted for in mass properties. It does not get placed onto the bill of materials. It's just a 3D phantom that's in your assembly that you can use for planning. But when it comes to how heavy is this, how many parts are in this thing, it doesn't get counted. So an envelope is just, like I said, a phantom part. So this is another way of using a master model. I'm going, I want to design the airfoils that are in this thing. Again, don't need to do a 2D sketch because I'm after this 3D geometry right here. Now when I open this part, sure enough, it's got a chunk of wing in there that I can use to help myself design. So 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to create myself a line. Yeah, I'm going to put in some. Geometry here, and I'm just going to extrude this thing much further than I really need it. Do a linear pattern. Instead of doing a feature, I'm actually going to say, no, I want to pattern bodies. I want to pattern this sheet of thickness. Um, there we are. Make sure I don't run off the edge of the wing here. Grab a bunch of those. So this is another way that you can use that cut with surface. Go into surfaces, cut with surface. I want to slice everything that's outside that wing away. There we go. I got a bunch of airfoils using that wing surface. You can leave this as solid bodies if you want. Um, there's different ways of using this. I mean, it's not going to hurt to leave it as a solid body, but at some point, maybe this is going to be individual GPNs, you know, for each size of airflow. So what I can do in that case is I can use this split command. It's strange because it says you have to split it with something. Pick anything and say cut it because it's already split up. Now what this can do for me is you'll see that it's tagged every one of these airfoils right there. If I double click right here, I can give it a part name and it'll break it out into parts. Remember in the last example, I right clicked on a body and said insert into new part. That's basically what this is doing. It's going to insert these things into their own part. I just have to give them whatever part number you're, you're just clicking I'm just double clicking in here and it's saying, okay, what do you want the name of the part to be? It's also going to use the default um, part template, whatever you've got set for your default template. See, it's not asking me if I want it in millimeters. So hopefully that's what my thing is set to. It takes a little time. Um, these may disappear because I didn't really check to see if I checked on the thing that said consume bodies or not. And apparently I did not. But what's going on in the background here? Let me go back into this. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, this consume bodies, if that's checked on, they disappear. If it's not checked on, they um, stay behind inside the model. If I go to Windows, Cascade, hey, what do you know? Each one of them's got its own part file with a reference to the original, which is great. Now I've got each part has its own individual thing, but I've got this parent that isn't really an assembly. It's still a multi-body part. If I right click on the split command, I can actually choose to create a, an assembly from this. There we go, create assembly. You gotta browse out so you tell it. Where you want it to be. If I zoom out, it puts them into an assembly with all of them located where they were wow. originally. Um, I have no idea why it decided to do 0, 3, 6, 1. Why didn't it do 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6? Because it didn't. But I can always reorder them if I'm going to be anal about it. But there you go. Also, when you're dealing with this kind of part, if I go back into that original assembly, Because I'm using that master model, the origin is correct. I mean, they're all using the same 000, zero point. So if I go to insert that assembly 
and drop it in at the X, it drops in right where it's supposed to, fixed in space. Bing, done. I've got an assembly that'll get me a bill of material or make an own drawing of it, whatever you want. So there we go, some master modeling technique. Again, some of that stuff used surfaces, some of it didn't, you get into a gray area. It's not like you always have to use surfaces to do master modeling. But I wanted to show you guys, you know, some of the reasons why we build these surfaces is downstream, you can use them to help you design other parts of the assembly based on those surfaces. So there we go, I'm one minute over this time around, which is better than last time around. You guys have any questions on any of that? Well, I hope you learned some stuff. We're going to be trying to do these classes more often. Is that correct, Monty? Yep. So, hoping to get two more of them for you next month. I'll be sending out the um, the surveys again, like I did last time.